My parents were very, very, very much church-going Catholics. You know, we would go to church faithfully every Sunday, go as a family, it's very important. My father was an usher, you know, that was definitely, St. Ambrose was our parish. But my grandmother truly raised me. During the day, my dad would go to work, my mom would go to work, and um, my grandmother, born in Italy, uh, her faith was just so dynamic. She prayed the rosary every day. She had her little prayer book by her bed, and everything was Jesus, 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 all the day long, you know? And she would take me to daily mass, and we would walk, the church was only a two and a half block walk, and I can remember holding her hand. She raised me from, you know, being a baby to nine years old. So it was my grandmother that really instilled in me that kind of faith daily, hourly faith, that you have to listen to God and be with God and, and Jesus, Jesus, you know. And, and because of her, I'm so grateful because I really and truly believe I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for my grandmother's love of God and helping me be that way too. Um, I was married for eight years, and unfortunately, I picked someone who also was abusive. And I dropped my voice because I don't like talking about that part. Um, and it just came to a point where I had to leave. So consequently, I left and I had nowhere to go. And then it was a year before I actually had a home. And nobody knows what that feels like until you go through with it. You end up saying that, you know, actually knowing that you have a home is so much a part of your identity. You know, you really can relate to the people that live in the streets. And my friend, he used to call me Doorway de Fiori. You know, that sounds funny, but it wasn't funny. You know, oh, you know. Your doorway de Fiore. And I never wanted to tell him how much he was hurting my feelings every time he said it, because I was afraid he was going to say it more. Eventually, I was blessed, you know, I ended up with the settlement, and I could find a place. Well, I bought that house in 1982, which was basically around the time I started the ministry. But I also took in my first unwed mother with baby. So I took an ad out on the paper, and uh, I started getting phone calls from pregnant women that needed a place to stay. But everybody loves babies, and everybody would be so thrilled. I mean, the people that we were working with, they'd give you car seats and strollers, and I'd come home from work, and there were all kinds of little baby things at my door from anonymous people, and my life was filled with mothers and babies. Little did I know that God, who has this unbelievable sense of humor, was going to decide that I'd get a fine. In 1984, I got a, it was $5,000, it started at five, from the state of New Jersey for running an unlicensed boarding house. And then it got made $10,000 because I refused to cooperate. I felt that I had a legal right to live out my Christian beliefs. And that was how things really started to explode. Everybody saw me in the news, and you know, people were very interested. A friend of mine knew Mother Angelica very well. He was a supporter of her ministry. And he picked up the phone, and he called her, and he said, you've got to help my friend out. And she said she would. So he flew me down with one of the mothers and a baby to be interviewed on Mother Angelica's show so that this opportunity for the people in New Jersey, maybe around the country, would you know, spread so that people would come in my defense. Eventually, the White House did. Ronald Reagan's White House called and called the governor on my behalf and said, this has got to stop. You know, so Mother Angelica was a, a real champion for me way back in 1984-85. I had met this man on the March for Life named Drew DeCourcy, and he had given me his business card. And he said, you know, if you ever need me for anything, let me know, because he knew I was sheltering girls, and he lived in New Jersey. Here's my home number. 
and he had mentioned he volunteered in her soup kitchen, Mother Teresa's soup kitchen in Newark. And I thought, gee, you know, let me call him, because that's the only contact I can think of. His wife answered the phone. He's, he was with her the night before. He was with Mother Teresa the night before. Within two phone calls, we had Mother Teresa on the phone. And she said she would do anything she could. She would visit the governor. She would talk to him on the phone. She would write a letter. She would do all three. The relationship continued and we wrote back and forth to each other. And in 1988, I asked her if she'd allow us to dedicate the Madonna della Strada, the statue in front of the main shelter, to her and to her work and to the sisters. And she wrote this very interesting letter to me back. And she said, I really think you should call it gift of love or gift of peace or gift of life. I am very devoted to the Blessed Mother and uh, she just makes my life so much easier. She mothers me when I need it. And she's such a good role model for the mothers. And we talk about Mary a lot. And uh, she's just so helpful. And I ask her to go to Jesus for me. And being the mother that she is, I have a feeling she probably kind of nags a little bit on my behalf. Kathy needs this. Kathy needs that. He probably says, I know, I know, Ma, I know. I took, I know, but she needs it now. When this place was purchased, we were a tiny little charity, and all we had was the original house on Prospect Street in Ramsey. And when I saw this, I thought, oh, this would be perfect. I mean, we could put an addition on the side. We could take the upstairs, make that our offices eventually. But we had no credit history, nothing. So, you know, I prayed to the Blessed Mother, and I really prayed. I said, Mary, please help us with the mortgage. I don't know how it's going to work, because all it was was me, you know, and it wasn't looking good as far as the banks. So I said, if we get the mortgage, the first thing I'm doing is I'm getting a really nice statue, and I'm going to put it right in front of this property. And we got the mortgage. I don't know how we got the mortgage, but we got the mortgage. She got her statue. And it came from Italy. It's called the Madonna della Strada. It's the most beautiful statue. And it's of her as a 14-year-old carrying the baby Jesus. And Madonna della Strada is the mother of the streets. And that's what our mothers are. They're in the streets, just like Apple. I'm very protective of the mothers, like a mother hen. And I would get calls from very famous shows, and they would find us on the internet, and they'd say, we need unwed mothers, we need women who have this situation going on in their lives for our talk shows. And I never let anybody talk to any of my mothers. I don't care who it was. Big name, didn't matter. They have a tough enough time with their lives. But someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew someone, 15 people back, said, there is this young man, and he really wants to meet you. And he's a really nice guy. And then they started to explain he'd done work for handicapped children, and he'd um, done a, a special film for children in Mexico for child trafficking, children who had been a part of that nasty business. And I said, hmm, that's special. Okay, I will meet with him. I will talk to him, I will meet with him. And when I met with Ron Krause, I, I was impressed, but I still wasn't trusted. You know, because I still had my mothers and my babies and I still, I didn't want to give them up to anybody, you know, even if he had done two great films. But then, for the first time in my life, I had something I experienced. I call it Divine's uh, Clock. It's like I heard this clock go off in my head and it said, he's okay. I kept getting this feeling, it was a timer. And like every 15 minutes I got, he's okay. And, and it was so annoying. It was like, he's okay. It was maybe my guardian angel kept whispering in my ear, like you can trust him, he's okay. Vanessa had a difficult time because Ron, 
the director insisted that she live at the shelter. So she, the first two or three days, we weren't sure she was going to even stay. I mean, she had to give up her cell phone. She had to live by the rules. You know, it was like nothing she'd ever experienced in Hollywood. Or that I'm sure. You know, but the girls had really, they were so happy she was there. And they were kind and they were excited. And, you know, after two or three days, she started to fit in a little bit. And she got to understand mostly that she loved the babies. I mean, we'd have to... When it came to the babies, she was just like always picking up the babies and playing with the babies. and So that helped take the edge off. But she actually lived at the shelter for two to three weeks. She had no family visits. She had no friends, nothing. She was just living in our world for two to three weeks. When I first got the script, I remember knowing immediately that this was something that I had to do. <laughs> um, it's kind of one of those roles that you just are hoping and praying that will come along and it kind of fell into my lap and I, uh, something about it, I just knew that I, I could tackle it and it's something that I was very passionate about doing and, and just uh, pushing myself. It was something that was kind of scary too and that's what you gotta kind of use as your compass. But the character itself has such a development and, and a transformation. She starts off as this street rat, in a sense, and becomes this beautiful young mother. Uh, so there's an, a major arc. And uh, just the, her story, you know, a, a young pregnant teen, mother abusive and drug addict, and growing up on the wrong side of town, and, and just struggling to survive. Uh, and then making it out on her feet and finding a family. It's just a really beautiful story. I think it's important to also mention Rosario Dawson. She put her heart, her soul, her mind into this. You got people asking all types of questions coming around my place looking around, you crazy. Huh? She said you carrying a baby. And I gotta hear about it from a stranger. That's nice, that's real nice. Humiliate me like that. What's wrong with you? And she would pull me aside and say, what you're doing is wonderful, this is great. You know, women need a place like this to go to. So she's a very special person and she did a wonderful job in this, as all the actors did. I think it's really great to, to tell these types of stories. They're not glamorous, they're not sweet, they're not super nice, or, you know, it looks at the harsher aspects of life, but you can still see joy, you can still see life and happiness, and why these people are heroes, making these efforts to, to step in where no one else is willing to, and, and people can actually walk out of the theater knowing something more, or connecting to something deeper than they had previously before sitting down, then that's always worth it. One of the most powerful scenes in the movie is when she gets up off the table and she bows through the door and then she runs and she opens the outside doors and she runs. And you see that over the rooftop shot and she's just running and running and running and running and running and she runs for her life and her baby's life. And I think that speaks, without words, that speaks volumes. And I think that is modeling the behaviors that we would like to see these young women have. And I see them because they come to the shelter. But I think the fact that this apple had the courage, after all that pressure, to say, I'm doing it, even if it's all by myself. I'm going to do it. I have the faith somehow that I'm going to be able to have this baby is, you know, it's like so powerful. We have so much that we do as actors that we burden the audience with bad stuff. Nothing wrong with giving them some good stuff now and then, you know. Good people, good situations. Uh, this, this whole story of this shelter is, is about good people. She did come to me and say, we're taking up collections for our ministry, which is to shelter uh, un unwed mothers, uh, girls who are pregnant, etc. 
And could we take a collection? And I said, yes. And so she gave a little spiel. Good morning, everybody. Or should I say good afternoon? I have been, thank you, here eight or nine times at Our Lady of Sorrows. 20 years ago, I was homeless. And I'm not sure I can really explain what it was like being without a home, frightened and alone, and all the while trying to hold on to my dignity as a woman. And then my life began to turn around. I found a job. I had a home. And then I had the most wonderful inspiration. I opened my home as a shelter for teenage pregnant girls. Because you see, I understand that this may be the only chance they have. So please open your hearts, take a look at your envelopes, so that we can give them shelter, we can give them guidance, we can give them an education, so that we can give them a future. Thank you, and God bless. The girls were outside the door with little buckets, and she made a nice collection. Our parishioners were very generous. Um, and that's, that's the way our connection, our relationship started. When you look at the film, you will see an image that is very Madonna-like. And it's when Apu is all by herself. She's left the clinic. She has nowhere to live. And she can't find any place. And she goes from car to car to car. And she finally finds a car that's unlocked. She goes into the back seat. She finds a blanket, a red blanket. And she takes the blanket and she puts it like a mantle over her head and she looks out the window and it's raining. And if you don't think that looks like the Madonna, there she is. It's okay. The mothers enjoyed being a part of the film. Um, Ron was the person who decided, the director said, I really want it to be us authentic as possible, and he cast real actresses, and he cast mothers, and he picked three of our mothers to be in the film, and uh, they loved every minute of it. They loved the hair, they loved their makeup, they loved the clothes, they loved the lines that they got. They just enjoyed every minute of it. Every baby in the movie is a several sources baby, with the exception of two because we needed a certain ethnicity, and they were twins. But every other baby is one of our several sources babies. I think the time when she, uh, Vanessa was here at the shelters, um, we spent about like two weeks. She would be asking me questions about how I felt when I was in like foster care, or how I felt when I was in the streets, you know, trying to find a shelter or waiting for her my interview for the shelter. But I think Vanessa, it was fun being around her cause she was just, I thought she was gonna be like Hollywood, like, oh no, stay away. But she was really nice. She was very, very, very loving to the kids, very understanding and very sweet about our situation. She at one point didn't like, you know, she didn't disrespect our home. She loved the work that Kathy did and she loved being around a bunch of the babies and, um, as I was, you know, telling her about how I felt or how trying to help her get into her character, she felt some t some nights she would feel drained, and I would feel so bad for her. But we would spend nights, hours and hours and hours, staying up just talking and talking and talking, and it was good. I got a chance to, you know, get to know her. She got a chance to get to know me besides like the movie part, which was good. She's a really, really sweet young lady and I enjoyed that I got a chance to meet her. They, they walk in the front door and they go like, what is this Jesus place all about? You know? And it's like, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. I know I need a place to stay, but I'm not sure I'm ready for this. 
And little by little, they see God's love in action through our nightly prayer. It's really funny. We have, uh, we go around when we pray and we ask the girls, what would you like to pray for? And they look at it like, what? What would I like to pray for? They can't think of a thing. But then they'll watch one of the other mothers say, I want to pray for my baby or I want to pray for my uncle. He just had a heart attack or something. And then within two or three weeks, you'll hear them saying, I want to pray for this. I want to pray for that. They learn how to pray. They do weekly Bible study, weekly chastity classes. A lot of them have no idea what the Bible's about at all. They each get their own Bible. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John could be like McDonald's as far as they're concerned. They have no clue what the Bible's about. But then they get to understand Jesus, faith, the miracles, the parables, and they start quoting them. You know, and they're like, they won't do chapter and verse, but they'll understand. And the next thing you know, they become women of faith. I'm always amazed at people who uh, get outside of their own needs for their lives and attend to the needs of others in a very strong and powerful way. I mean, mothers do it, but I have three, and that's all. Kathy, you have uh, hundreds that you set on their way, and that kind of uh, courage and uh, devotion, really, to the, to the lives of others who are, I find extraordinarily uh, moving and meeting these fabulous young women, uh, raising their babies. Uh, I just found the whole thing quite extraordinary, that the whole experience of uh, just spending time talking to them and our world colliding with their world. Um, and we each needed each other. I needed to know about them and what it said, what's it like. And they needed to get, I don't know, they did beautifully, so it never looked as though they were lost on set, but surely that's not a world they're comfortable with just yet. So it, I thought it was a lovely um, experience. Uh, very, very, very good. What I always say to the mothers is, yes, we want you to have a beautiful, healthy baby, and we're gonna do everything humanly possible to make that happen. But it's extremely important that you love God, you know God, you live a life that will be symbolic to this baby of your love for God and that you teach this baby about God because when you leave here, as surely you will do someday, I want you to walk out the front door with your baby in your arms and with God in your heart so that as your child grows up to be 6, 8, 10, 15, 20, 30 years old, you're going to see a godly child because when you go to heaven, you want to be able to know that your child is in heaven, not the other place because you didn't do your job as a mother. And that's something that I preach to them just about every day, every single day, you know, so that it's embedded in their psyches that they have a spiritual responsibility to God. This child is alive and they have to bring the child to his commandments. They have to bring the child to his holy word. They have to bring the child to church so that when the child is not with the mother, the child is gonna know, I gotta go to God. You know, someday she's going to leave this earth too, and that child should be fully right with God. He's a caring man trying to help young people. That's a very important task these days. Um, but it's the best part of the Catholic Church, I believe, is the, the humanist part. Caring for people, the people, it's very important, and he's one of those people. He's Hi, the priest I'm for the shelter. One of the house mothers here. Welcome to our shelter. I'll let Kathy know you're here. That's Kathy right there with Mother Teresa. And that's her and that one there with... Uh, at the White House with Ronald Reagan. Oh, hello, Father. Good to see you. My two favorite scenes are the one in the great room when it's Christmas. <laughs> and 
and you see Kathy taking the picture and you see all the girls on the steps because we do that every year. And you see that glory to God in the highest sign. So when I see that scene, I'm like, whoa, I'm in seventh heaven. I'm like, wow, there I am. That's me with the camera. One, two, three. Merry Christmas. You see the girls, Merry Christmas. And that's kind of like our Christmas card. So that's one of my absolute favorite scenes. The other scene is um, really when she gives birth to the baby. And she just kept saying over and over and over and over, my baby, my baby, my baby, my baby. I have been in so many labor and delivery rooms and that seems to be what the girls do. I mean, it, it gives me a cold shiver from elbow to elbow as I say this to you because that's what they'll go. You know, they just bond with their babies. They have no one else other than us, several sources, to be with them in a shelter. Their parents aren't with them usually, once in a while. Okay, boyfriends aren't with them usually, maybe once every 30 girls will have a baby's father show up. So it's them and the baby. And so consequently, that scene in the movie is so dramatic. I can't help but cry every time I see that scene. I love the person I am today. And because I chose life, because I had a son who I was willing to give life to, and he taught me how to be a mom, he taught me how to be a woman, he taught me how to be a woman of God, how to be strong, and how to not let anyone break me down. So my life right now, it's awesome. I love it, and I have beautiful women in my life, beautiful kids in my life, and I can call them family. So that's something that I've been longing for forever, and I'm glad I got it. I think this film needs to be watched by all Catholics. I think um, pastors, as well as um, their parishioners, I think uh, youth groups, I think it's something that we should be very proud of. I think it singles out a cornerstone of our faith and that we, together, are trying to change the culture. And we can get behind a film like this, a beautiful film like this, that's really not too preachy. It just takes a young woman who's got the courage to have her baby, and then it shows somebody like myself who says, okay, and there's a wonderful priest, you know, Father McCarthy, James Earl Jones, who says, I can help you. And he's so gentle, he's so loving, he's never condemning. He's always there for her, praying with her. I just think, I think this film in a way evangelizes the Catholic Church. It shows a side of the Catholic Church that you're not gonna see a lot in the media. And for that reason, I'm extremely proud to be a part of it. I, I believe the movie will help Catholics and principally those who have a problem of this sort. I liked the stepmother, uh, Mrs. Fitzpatrick, was it? I liked the stepmother. Uh, Agnes, where are you from? A lot of places. Uh, from the viewpoint of giving you a view of how very nice people can feel about this. This is an interruption in our lives. This is not, this is not, worth our time. This will make life miserable for everybody without seeing the wonder of the creation of an, of an infant, the co-creation. Uh, and we, the old saying is, we don't know how God thinks, uh, but he thinks differently than we think. Uh, this is paraphrasing. So therefore, if we know something is right or wrong, we should follow the right with trust, with trust that God will see to it. Um, if you read the lives of the saints, they all had, at time, not all, but many of them had awful things happen to them. And they looked back to the cross and they said, somehow, this is the way I should live. 
So are you going to help me out? No matter what happens, if we trust, that's the key. Uh, for me, that's the key. I have to trust in God, no matter what happens. And it's the key for everybody, I think. So you can make a joy out of a, an unhappy situation, worldly unhappy, but you can make a joy out of it by trusting in the Lord. When I see that movie, I look at myself and I say, well, that's not really the all me. You know, it's part me. But I hope and I pray that inspires people to do what I do. I hope that they say, gee, that's an interesting type of person. And I hope they say, maybe there's some of me that she's portraying, and maybe I could do what she's doing, because that's what we need. We need more me's. We need more people who are going to step up to the plate and say, I've got a spare bedroom. I've got a house that I'm not using. These girls need places to live because if this movie is successful, there are not going to be enough beds. I'm not going to have enough beds. And that means that women are going to go and they're going to follow through with the appointment because we're not going to have enough shelters. So the movie is a double-edged sword. I'm glad the movie's out there, but I'm afraid it's out there. And I can tell you, I've had to fly girls in from California, fly girls in from Florida, because there wasn't an open bed in the whole state. So we, as Christians, as Catholics, as people who believe that these babies have a right to life, we have to also know that their mothers need a place, a safe place, so that they can have their babies. That's, that's the truth. That's my biggest fear. What happens? They see the movie and then we don't have any place to put them. What's that going to feel like? What's that going to be like? The phone rings off the hook. We have no beds left. That's big. That's big. The, the church is going to have to do something. You know, everybody watching this documentary is going to have to think about it. You're planting seeds today. I hope Give Me Shelter inspires women, you know, to, you know, choose life, to know that there are more options than, you know, leaving and not dealing with the baby. To know that they have hope in any type of situations that they're going through, whether they're pregnant, addicted to any type of drug or anything, that it's hope and it's help. That is what I think Gimme Shelter is all about, you know, that you're not alone. In every aspect that you go through, you're not alone, and you won't be alone. People bring you down. People will tear you apart. You need to know that you're beautiful just the way you are. Because you are stronger. People will tear me apart I know that I'm beautiful I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful People will bring me down People will tear me Just one